Welcome to the Orthodontics in Conference podcast, where Farouk brings you the summary of key lectures from orthodontic conferences around the world with your host, Farouk Ahmed. Welcome to this episode of Orthodontics in Conference. This is the third and final day of this year's British Orthodontic Conference being summarized for the podcast. We're going to cover four key lectures, the first being by Kevin O'Brien looking at research in orthodontics, followed by the Chapman Prize from 2021 by Alika Tishlaki. We're also going to cover Nikki Mandel's multi-center randomized control trial and the findings from her study. And the conclusion will be that of Clinical Pearls, where we have a variety of clinicians describing their tips for our clinical practice. And a reminder that the podcast is an opinion piece for myself and may not be 100% accurate or representative of the lecture. However, we try and ensure that it is. It is not endorsed by an institute or speaker and is the independent work of myself and the Orthodontics in Summary team. Guys, I will catch up with you at the end to give you my reflections on the third and final day of this year's BOC. This lecture is entitled Searching for a Needle in a Haystack by Kevin O'Brien. Kevin delivered his usual dynamic lecture looking at orthodontics in its breadth and depth to give an overall view of where we are and potential for the future in relation to research. He started off by describing patient-centered research and how it has been mentioned within the orthodontic literature. Initially, it was described by Shaw in 1980. However, This notion that Shaw mentioned about evidence for the justification of orthodontics being vague still hasn't been resolved some 40 years onwards. Kevin's had an interest in looking at consumer-centred research. And actually, is it orthodontist measured values that we're looking at in our research and clinical practice, or are we looking at patient-centred values? He described things such as cephalometric outcomes on par being irrelevant to patients. Kevin did some research looking into this with Aliki in 2014, and they did a systematic review looking at the outcomes of what our randomized controlled trials did. And the majority, and I'm sure we wouldn't be surprised, looked at malocclusion and correction of it. The next biggest cohort was looking at costs, but actually things that do affect patients, adverse outcomes, quality of life, function and consequences were really low down in what our trials were looking at. And Kevin's opinion on this was that the important measures to our patients are infrequently measured within our studies. Kevin then went on to do some further research in 2020, looking at if malocclusions and orthodontic treatment have an impact on oral health. This was in 2020. They did a systematic review again, and what they found was scarce literature looking at this topic. There were some findings and it showed that orthodontic treatment for patients with increased overjet does reduce their risk of trauma. But there was an absence of evidence for all the other parameters of which orthodontic practice takes place. His conclusion was that we're measuring orthodontic outcomes, not patient outcomes. What Kevin went on to describe is that when it comes to oral health, we're looking at really the comfort and function of the dentition, which allows an individual to continue their lives. And really, our question should be posed in that direction as opposed to our orthodontic measurable outcomes. Another enjoyable lecture by Kevin. He always describes his retirement taking place, but he is still very much delivering lectures and active. And I'm grateful that he's still continuing to deliver his content. This lecture is entitled Orthodontic Trials, Are We Measuring the Right Things? This was a Chapman 2021 prize, which was awarded to Aliki Tishlaki. So this was Aliki's PhD. And this award-winning lecture looked at developing a core set of outcomes for routine clinical orthodontic trials, which I thought was really interesting because we appeared to be in lots of clinical trials and different types of studies, So I perceived that we'd already got this information. But actually what this group was doing and working with Aliki specifically when it comes to orthodontic outcomes is getting back down to the fundamentals. Are we meeting the needs of the stakeholders? Looking at outcomes relevant to patients being at the centre, clinicians and best evidence practice. And the idea being that once these core set of outcomes are made, future research will use it to measure up against 
and therefore there will be less variation in what and how we're measuring and therefore and meta-analyses will be more accurate. We are better informed as clinicians. Now, what I liked about this group is that they've got a the Medical Research Council behind them, supported by a variety of different organizations and bodies, but they also have a patient-facing side to them. So this idea now of not just being for clinicians and academics, but actually our patients should be aware of what these outcomes are as well. So how did Aliki do this enormous conceptual task? Well, it consisted of a mixed methods approach, a systematic review, as well as qualitative analysis. She combined both of those together to set and establish a set of core outcomes. And this went through a process of backwards and forwards between groups, committees, patients to iron it down. And it resulted in four key themes and seven outcomes. And those themes were breakages of appliances and teeth, clinical outcomes, such as alignment, skeletal changes, and stability. Third being delivery of care, such as patient-related adherence. And the fourth being perceived health status. And the idea that Aliki then put forward is that for future clinical research, we should be aiming for these four themes to be involved in our trial, so it's relevant outcomes to patients. But the minimum, we should be aiming for one. Now, I think this was real food for thought for anybody conducting research currently or in the future. And actually putting these at the basis may be more arduous, more work most definitely. But it means in the immediate sense, those outcomes that we achieve will be more relevant to our patients, or arguably a main stakeholder, but also in the future, it provides greater emphasis and reliability to any systematic reviews. So we're better informed long term as well. I do look forward to seeing people adopting Aliki Tishlaki's core outcome sets and it being utilised in orthodontics. This lecture is entitled Functional Appliance Treatment. Do long waiting lists really matter? a multi-centre randomised control trial by Nikki Mandel. So Nikki Mandel starts off by giving some background to this research. It's based in the northwest of England, where the waiting list is of several thousands of patients. The waiting list, on average, to start treatment from referral is around 18 months. And what Nikki wanted to investigate here is that if there is any clinical or psychological impact of this delay in treatment for functional appliance therapy. So it was a randomised control trial and essentially had two arms to it. The first arm started immediately and then went to nighttime wear only for 18 months. And the second arm had the delay of 18 months and then started their functional appliance. And it was a conventional functional appliance type study using a twin block appliance with 7mm overjet and looking at an endpoint when the overjet was resolved. So what were the results from this randomised control trial? Well, what they found was that overall there was no difference in the occlusal or skeletal outcomes. Now what's interesting is to look at the difference in the age groups between these patients. So the immediate group, group 1, was between 12 and 13. The later group was between 13 and 14. And the average was an 18-month difference between these two. Interestingly, there was no psychological difference either for the immediate or later group. And Nikki presented a range of cephalometric statistics and occlusal changes, which essentially showed no changes between the two. With respect to the intervention, interestingly, when it came to treatment times, the immediate group, or the early treated group, took 13 months on average, whereas the later treated group took 10 months on average. And I think that's an interesting finding, and Nikki was hypothesizing as to what could have resulted in this. But I look forward to seeing her publication on this topic. The next lecture is entitled Clinical Pearl Session from the British Orthodontic Conference 2021. It is one of my favourite sessions from the conference. Topics covered include using gold brackets, pontics for fixed appliances, new tools to measure spaces for hyperdontia, social media, ligation and video consultations. To start off with was Prepal Bogle and he spoke about gold brackets. And you very honestly describe the challenges with the aesthetic brackets. Ceramic brackets, plastic or composite brackets have challenges either when it comes to performance of the bracket or removal of the bracket or harm to the dentition. What we really want, and I think I would agree with this, is a metal bracket. The challenge comes is the aesthetics that ensue. So he described the gold brackets, specifically the ones from American orthodontics, the iconic brackets. 
He described them as being exactly the same as a master series, which is their metal equivalent. Now, the aesthetics he described as being better than the metal ones and the champagne colour. He describes them as an upsell from metal brackets, but still cheaper than ceramic. So they're occupying essentially a new territory. And as he said this, I remember thinking of the iPad when it first came about. Nobody thought it had a place in the market, but actually is now well entrenched. He gave the advantages versus ceramic appliances. They're cheaper, less friction, deeper tie wings. They have a performance which is far easier, both in clinical practice, during treatment, but also when it comes to debonding the appliances as no special instruments are required. I haven't used these brackets, I must profess, but it's something I'd be interested in getting a hold of a sample of them and seeing what happens. Next up was Ian Murphy describing a trick to make the Pontic stick. He mentioned how the traditional approach of taking an impression for a Pontic tooth and putting it onto fixed appliances, and he described the high rates of debonding taking place. And he described it on two accounts, one of the tooth not being supported at the gingival aspect, therefore greater occlusal loading and bouncing taking place, and also composite being weak in compression. So his tip was to utilise a flange, an acrylic flange both labially and lingually on the pontic tooth, to make an undercut under where the bracket was going to be seated on the actual acrylic tooth, but then not to place it until the tooth was lying on the gingiva. At that stage, when you know it's passive and seated, then to position the bracket, using the arch wire as a guide. A simple pearl, but one where the sequence is essential to ensuring an ideal outcome. Next was Jane Harrison, and she was describing a new measuring tool called LISA, and what she can do for you. So this is the Liverpool Implant Space Assessment. It's a precision milled space analysis tool, and it essentially allows for different spaces to be measured for a pontic tooth, varying from 5 millimeters all the way up to 14 and 18 millimeters. So what they found is that the usage of this LISA tool on their own hyperdontia clinics has resulted in greater accuracy in delivering space. Now previously it was 43% and now it's 72%. And this is interesting because it's not an appliance which is delivering greater space, it's not opening or closing space, it's simply making the measurement objective. And I know from my own hypodontic clinics, there's debates, mostly aggressive, that take place as to what is the actual space there. And they'll go backwards and forwards, increasing and reducing space. I think just having a tool as simplistic as it sounds means it takes that subjectivity out. It looks small, it looks large. So I think it's a great idea. I know that Jane Harrison and the team from Liverpool are working on trying to get this appliance made available and look forward to using it on my own clinics. Next up was Mohammed al Muzian describing how to harness social media to market, educate and set up an orthodontic practice. It was great to see Mo on stage. He's also been a guest on the podcast previously as well. He described the five elements of setting up social media for marketing. He started off by describing the target audience and to always be conscious as to who we're aiming our marketing at. Selecting the correct platform, getting a manager and delivering consistently. He spoke about engagement in social media, and I think it's also common to be shy about what we do. But Muhammad took an approach that it's very much about informing our patients, but also using patient-friendly tools, such as using morphing images for our pre- to post-treatments, to have regular times and slots for delivering this information. He also spoke about other ways to engage, not just the clinical. He described a whole host of processes he's done sponsoring local school teams and businesses, supporting local charities. He's also spoke about customer-orientated business developments. For example, the use of a cleaning robot, which in itself is a eye-catching tool for patients and people walking by. It's just another tool for engagement. For patients when they're finishing treatment, having a red carpet, a clipboard to take images on for themselves for their own social media, shows you're not only engaging just for yourself, but also having an interaction with patients on social media. Now, Mo seemed far advanced when it came to the use of technology, so he mentioned he has an in-house laboratory to make his retainers and aligners, and uses a QR code on the screen. So each patient can view their own aligners or retainers being made as it's taking place, far beyond my scope to understand. He spoke about teaching using social media, 
So as you guys will know, Mohamed El Muzin has a group for specialists and trainees called the Orthodontic Mastery Group. Over 10,000 members now, but also he's delivered 300 webinars through this process. Next up was Safura Kestager, and she was describing the use of floss to ligate malaligned teeth. And for this, it was very simple pearl, simply getting some floss, pulling it over the arch wire and taking it through the contact point in the palatal direction. In doing so, it allows this nickel titanium arch wire to flex, but also to engage with the bracket, therefore making it far easier to ligate the tooth. Next was Megan Hatfield in the final clinical poll about being in praise for the video consultation. So Megan switched to using video consultation during the pandemic, and she described how, in a pragmatic way, she's introduced it and used it. So in the average day, the patients get booked in for their video consultation alongside her general clinical appointments. And she described how she does it, the changes and things she keeps the same from the clinical through to the virtual. So the things that are changed, well, she has a lighting, she has a checklist, she has typodonts to hand, things to help explain what may be easier to do face to face. She mentioned how she conducts the same checks, both in the history, the medical history side, to ensure things are still in order. She carries out, in her words, a form of a clinical exam. And I think that's a real challenge, but also I'm really interested to know as to how do we carry out virtual clinical consultations, if that terminology is correct. What's interesting is what effects this has had to Megan's practice. So conversion rate has gone from 21% up to 35% through this video method. And I think it's really responding to how patients want to have this information delivered and how they're going to be more receptive to it. What's the advantages? Well, it's low risk, it's free, there's low commitments to it, but actually we're creating a new platform for ourselves in this process as well. And there are patients who are exclusively looking on this platform there are disadvantages, well, the inability to examine, as we've already mentioned. There can be poor connections, but also it takes admin time to set these up and to get the paperwork done. That brings us to the end of day three and the final day of the British Orthodontic Conference. So my reflections on this day, well, I think it's an interesting one. It seemed to be a heavy research base to the third day. It looks like going forwards, there needs to be a twist to our research. We're doing quite a lot of it, but we may have gone off course from things relevant to the patients. Nikki Mandel's study, the randomized control trial, was a real-world piece of research. We get patients who have delayed referrals for functional appliance therapy, but now we know what effects that can have to patients. The clinical pearl session, I do enjoy it. I think it's great to see people sharing what they clinically do so the rest of us can benefit from it. And one could argue that's the same thing that the academics and researchers are doing as well. And I think it's interesting, this contrast between the research that was given at the start of the day, looking at clinical tips at the end of the day. How do we stop the pontic from bouncing around on the arch wire? To what we put on social media, to put on Instagram for our patients. I think it shows the field of orthodontics for what it is. It is a science, but it's also a dexterous field, and it's also a vocational, engaging field as well. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Orthodontics in Conference. Please do subscribe and look forward to the next episode.